Praise the Lord, everybody. If we could please stand. We got a couple of prayer requests that we want to bring before the Lord. Uh, Let's pray for Sister Olivia. She is going in. Uh, She's having some pains in her head, and they're going to go in and do an ultrasound. Sister Amanda said they're going to be checking her out uh, in the near future. Is that tomorrow? Tomorrow, so we want to pray for uh, Sister Olivia. There's a prayer request here for Savannah in need of a healing. A prayer request here for also Sophia and Sadie for salvation and a healing also. And if you have a need tonight, a prayer request that you just want to lift your hand and let it be known unto the Lord, we'll lift our hands up tonight. And God knows every need that's in the house, but let's pray for Sister Olivia, for Savannah, Sadie, and Sophia, and every hand that's went up for your needs as well tonight. Dear Lord Jesus, we come to you tonight, Lord, asking you to meet every need that's in the house, Jesus. You see those that are sick in body tonight, those that are in need of of a healing, and those that are in need of salvation, a spiritual healing. We ask God in your mighty name, Jesus, that you would touch, that you would minister in a mighty way, that you would touch Sister Olivia, Lord, that you would would move in a mighty way, Lord, that your hand would be upon her. You see every hand that went up. You know every need that's in the house tonight, Lord. We're praying in the name of Jesus that you would heal those that are sick, Lord, that you would open the doors that you want to open and close the doors that you want to close. We ask you to, to minister in this house tonight, that you would join us in this service, Lord. God, we pray your holy name in the name of Jesus we pray and let the church say amen let's sing along and worship with the praise team tonight oh let's continue to worship the king of kings and the lord of lords tonight mm-hmm. sing the lord is my shepherd the lord is my shepherd he goes before me he goes before me. Defender behind me. Defender behind me. I won't fear. I won't fear. Oh, I'm filled with anointing. I'm filled with anointing. My cup is overflowing. My cup's overflowing. How many know that no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper? No weapon can harm me. So I won't fear. I won't fear. People of God, sing high.
have the Holy Ghost, you should be able to sing this part. Sing your spirit lives within you. Clap of praise unto the Lord this evening. We love you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Causes 
soul of hell to tremble. Oh, when somebody speaks the name Jesus, all of heaven stands there to touch him. Who holds the power to raise up the lame, part the Red Sea waters, and form dry land? Who holds the power to set every captive free, make the dead to live again? the Lord tonight. Come on. Hallelujah. We are not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Oh, somebody praise Him. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome Oh, sing on. 
He's an awesome. He's an awesome God. Somebody put your hands together for the Lord tonight. Jesus, we love you. He's Alpha. Jesus. Well, you know, <laughs> it's kind of funny. To the world, this is Super Bowl week. <laughs> you know, they'll paint their face one color on one side, different color on the other side, and their hair will be a wild, and they'll throw popcorn and beer all over each other, scream and yell over a couple of guys that run a football down a field. And there's not one of them that can save their soul. There's not one of them that can heal their body. There's not one of them that can provide a need. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know what? At the end of the game, all somebody's going to have is bragging rights. But guess what? When the game is over, they start all over again. Got ground zero for next year. But can I tell you something about Jesus? 
Amen. Of his kingdom there shall be no end. Of his greatness there is no measure. Hallelujah. He is the Alpha. He is the Omega. He is the beginning. He is the end. He's the first. He's the last. He's the best thing that ever happened in my life. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. And they think we're crazy. Oh, but if you understood, sir or ma'am, amen, what, where some of us came from. Amen. Some of us came from the alcoholic world. Some of us came from the drug world. Some of us came from a world uh, where we wanted to kill ourselves. Come on. Amen. God saved us from a whole lot of junk. Amen. And tonight, uh, I, I feel good in my body. I feel good in my soul. I'm in my right mind. Amen. And I'm giving the Lord some praise because He's been so good to me. He's been so good to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, man, hey, man, hey, man. Woo. My, my, I got to quit. I got to quit. I got to quit. I'm not preaching tonight. I got to quit. Hey, man, hallelujah. But I feel the Holy Ghost in the house tonight. Hey, man, hey, man, hey, man. Hallelujah. So very, very good to have all of our guests tonight. Thank you for coming to be with us. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. It's good to see young brother and sister Rao tonight. Amen. Hadn't seen them in a long, long time. Amen. Good to see you folks. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Off up here in God's country. Amen. <laughs> Amen. They know what I'm joking about. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. I'm telling you something. I made the comment a few weeks ago. I made the comment a few weeks ago, but it has carried through. Amen. When the first of the year came, this church made a turn. Amen. The spirit of this church made a turn. Amen. I know we're being fought on every side by every devil in hell. You know what? But greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. Amen. Hallelujah. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. Amen. We are victorious. I said we are victorious. Oh, hallelujah. And revival is happening. I said revival is happening. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we've only just begun. Amen. Who knows what the Lord is going to do before this year is finished out. Amen. There is. Amen. We, we may have to put out folding chairs. Amen. Hallelujah. You can have my seat. I'll stand up. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. You can find your way back to your places. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. So thankful. So thankful for the privilege and the honor to be a part of the family of God. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Praise God. And we're going to ask Brother Jonathan, if he would, Brother Jonathan Coger is going to come to the pulpit tonight, going to open the word of the Lord and minister to us. Amen. Brother Jonathan, Lord bless you. Praise the Lord. Let's give him a hand clap this evening. We bless your name, God. We bless your name. We bless your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. He's always got a plan. He's always got a way about him. His plan isn't your plan. You know, but you just got to learn to trust in God because he knows what he's doing. And if he's keeping some things from you, chances are you just get in his way. You know, so sometimes God has to move and he's got to do things without letting you know what he's going to do. Amen. I was praying the other day, and the Lord showed me something. I said, what, what's this, Lord? A shotgun. Double barrel. Double barrel shotgun. I never used this across the pulpit before, Lord. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Buckshots. You know, sometimes the Lord gives you some pretty heavy things, and, you know, you don't feel adequate to, to fire off some of the things that he gives you, but... You know, I'm just going to go ahead and fire off this double barrel shotgun. And uh, you know what? If you go home missing a pinky toe or a, a left hand, you didn't need it anyway to make heaven, right? You know, if I blow some things out of the water this evening, you didn't need it to make heaven, right? 
Oh, don't get quiet on me now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. The Lord is good. Amen. He's real good. And, and who am I if I don't preach the things that, that God gives me? Amen. You know, I didn't expect all the visitors and guests tonight, but I will say this. If you don't like my preaching and you don't like me, get in line. It'll probably wrap around the building. But you'll want to come back to hear one of these guys preach because we got some really good preachers around here. Amen. Can I get a witness in the house tonight? Are we going to loosen up or what? Hallelujah. If you got a chip on your shoulder, just go ahead and knock that chip off your shoulder. All right. If you're a little too uptight, why don't you take a couple of barrettes out of your hair. Amen. Because we're going to preach tonight. We're going to deliver God's word tonight. And I don't care what spirit you brought with you tonight. I'm telling you, I don't care what crawled in here tonight. I'm preaching God's word. You know, there's, there may be some spiritual varmints in this house tonight, but I got buckshot. I got some spiritual buckshot. And I may not know how to shoot in the spirit like my pastor. But you know what? I'm just going to start firing it off. And if you're a visitor, if you're a guest, I apologize, you know. But uh, I'm just going to keep pulling the trigger, amen? If you would grab your Bible tonight and go with me to 2 Timothy 4 and 14. That's 2 Timothy 4 and 14. The title of the message tonight is Stand. One word, Stand. If there's anything we need to learn to do in this day and this time, it's stand. I'm not talking about backing down. I'm not talking about compromising. I'm not talking about letting things in that you haven't let in in years. I'm not talking about letting this little sin and that little sin in your house, in your life. I'm talking about making a stand. I'm talking about standing on God's word. I'm talking about standing on your convictions. And if you've come to the place where you've let some things in, you need to redraw that line. You need to stand on God's word. We need to make a stand in this day. This world is pushing up on us. This world is pushing up on us. They're trying to back us up. But you know what? We're the church, and if it's written in the Bible, we believed it 2,000, 6,000 years ago, and we still believe it today. Can I get an amen? Is there a believer in the house? Is there anyone in this house that believes in the scriptures of God? So we need to stand. 2 Timothy 4 and 14 Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. He did me much evil. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must beware of him, for he has greatly resisted our words. At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. May it not be charged against them. The Lord is faithful. But the Lord stood with me, and he strengthened me, so that the message might be preached fully through me, and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion, and the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And you may be seated. You know, Alexander the coppersmith, he apparently followed around the disciples and he, his main purpose was to try to discredit them with blasphemous words to refute the gospel that the, the apostles were preaching. Alexander the coppersmith wanted to oppose Paul personally and defame him, trying to taint Paul's testimony and the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it seems that many of us in the faith, at one time or another, we come across an Alexander the coppersmith that oppose our testimony. You know, Alexander could be a neighbor, a co-worker, a family member. Alexander the coppersmith can be a husband or a wife. But Paul said, I withstood him. You know, we fight 
the good fight not by attacking their character in return, but by proving our character in time and continuing to stand on God's word. You can't attack those that are attacking you. You can't defame their character like they're defaming you. But you stand and you withstand them by being a Christian of God. You know, Paul says in Romans, not to be overcome with evil, but we overcome evil with good. Paul had it right when he wrote to the Ephesians, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all, stand. We need to learn again, once again in Pentecost and the apostolic ranks to put on the whole armor of God. The devil has so many devices to distract you, to take up your time, to take your attention away from God. But what happened to the men that sat down and read their Bibles for hours? What happened to the men and women that would pray for hours? What happened to the families that knew how to put on the whole armor of God? You just don't go out into battle with a sword. You don't go out into battle just wearing a helmet. You need the full armor of God. You need the shield of faith. You need to be ready to fight because I want to let you know the devil's come ready to fight. The Bible says that Satan's come down with great wrath and we need to resist that wrath. You know, they've drawn a line and it's called the gates of hell and we need to draw a line. We ain't backing down. We ain't moving back, but we're moving forward in God. The apostle James had it right when he wrote, therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. And the reason is, is because the devil doesn't have all the time in the world. He's too busy running to and fro. He's, he wants to see who's weak you know, he, he's like the predator. He's looking for the elderly. He's looking for the one that's limping. He's looking for the weakling. And that's why we need to stand in this day and put on the whole armor of God. Peter knew what he was talking about when he wrote, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him. Don't give in to the devil. You know, sometimes we find ourselves just sitting there listening to the devil. What are you doing in my ear, devil? You ever said that out loud? Come on, I want you to say that out loud. What are you doing in my ear, devil? What are you doing in my ear, devil? You know what? We need to resist that old devil. He's been playing tricks on you. He's been playing tricks on your family way too long, and we're not going to let him get away with it anymore, amen? You know, he's been planning. He's been plotting against you. He wants to see how far he could drag you down. We need to resist the devil. I remember one preacher, I can't remember his name, but he pulled a chair out and he said, Devil, have a seat. I got to talk to you. He told him how he felt, and then he opened the door and said, get out of my house. <laughs> and I think we need to really, and we don't need to spend time talking to the devil, but we need to resist him. When we feel that slithery, slimy, ugly little presence crawl into to the room, we need to rebuke that in Jesus' name. Three times Alexander is mentioned could this be the same Alexander in 1 Timothy 1 and 18 where Paul is encouraging Timothy to fight the good fight? You see, when Alexander the coppersmith can't prevail against you, he or she will attack those you love. This charge I commit to you, son Timothy, according to the prophecies previously made concerning you, that by them you may wage the good warfare, having faith and a good conscience, which some, having rejected concerning the faith, have suffered shipwreck. 
of whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I delivered to Satan, that they may not learn to blaspheme. You know, they once traveled in the faith. They once walked the Christian walk. But backsliding is not good enough for backsliders. It's not just good enough to depart from the faith. They want you to fail in your walk with God also. You know, some backsliders might only be saved when they realize how cruel a master Satan is. So Satan's sons and daughters will blaspheme God, and when you draw a line, when you decide to stand on the convictions that God gave you, when you start making the right choices, it makes you wonder how many times you took the easy way out and compromised. You know, that's an ugly word tonight, compromise. Jesus was tempted with small, trivial compromises. You know, it's, it's such a small task, Jesus. Why don't you just turn this stone into bread? And, and Satan will try to get you to compromise on such a small thing. You know, uh, why don't you come stand on this rock and look at all the kingdoms of this earth? You know, it's so easy to prove you're a child of God. Why don't you just dash your foot against the stone and the angels will carry you up? But he didn't realize that Jesus was the stone and Jesus is the rock. And if Jesus taught us anything during the temptation of Satan, it was how to stand against the devil. Can I get an amen? When things are going well, it's so easy to make a small justification. You know, a small, unnoticed compromise. And instead of facing the flood, the storm, or the flames, you compromise. But compromise is a hungry beast. You know, you feed it once. You know, if you're going to feed compromise once, you better build a dog house or a cat house. You ever had a stray cat come up to your porch and your kids feed it? That cat starts spraying all over all your porch all of a sudden. He feels like he owns your place. You, know? you ever see them people that like cats? If you like cats, I'm sorry. All right? They make my eyes itchy. They make my nose runny. All right? They got claws. They stink. <laughs> you know, and you see these people with their cats, you know, and one's not enough. All of a sudden, three, four, five, six cats move in. All of a sudden, your house is filled with cats, and you're the cat lady. And that's the way compromise is. You know, you bring one little kitty cat in, and all of a sudden, you're the cat lady. You know, uh, compromise is like a little dog. You know, it just wants to sit on your lap all the time and be pet. Show everyone that it's yours. Amen. The other night, night pastor was preaching. He was preaching some, you know, one time I felt like God didn't like me. I laughed because I feel the pressure right now. The pressure's on me, you know, and I wasn't laughing at you because I know you went through some hard times, but I laughed because here I am, you know, I'm getting pressed on. I get a bill in the mail. I didn't expect $6,000. Get another bill in the mail next couple days, $2,000. You know, I'm in between jobs. Every light on the dash of my car is on. <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden I got this little mouse in my house. All right, my wife probably don't want me to tell this story, but every once in a while you get a little mouse in your house. And, and you know what? I've, I've had a mouse in the house before. You give me 24 hours, that mouse is gone. Peanut butter on a mouse trap. You get them every time. But I laid out all these traps all across the house. Woke up the next day, and all the peanut butter is eating off all the traps. 
And I said, Lord, you're pressing on me so hard, now you're going to anoint the mouse in my house? I can't even get rid of this mouse. But, you know, upon further investigation, I realized it wasn't a mouse. It was my dog <laughs> licking the peanut butter. You know, we're thinking, oh, well, hopefully our dog will catch the mouse. No, he's, he's making sure the mouse ain't getting caught. Job security. <laughs> but compromise wants to move into your house. And compromise wants to take over, amen? So compromise is like a lie that you have to cover with another lie. Then another lie. Then another compromise and another compromise. And pretty soon you're a full-blown liar, a full-blood compromiser lying in the lap of the father of lies. But what if you decided right here and right now to stand up for what is right? You know, you know it's right. You know, your peers might accept it. Your neighbors might accept it, but you know it's right, and you need to draw a line. What if you made a stand against what was wrong? What if you drew a line and said, I will not sell out. I will not give you an inch. I will not back down. Are you willing to stand? Are you willing to wait? Thank you, Jesus. What if you didn't care what you had to lose and there was nothing that could be offered to you where you'd give up your morals? Nothing, no price could be paid to where you'd give up your beliefs. You'd never denounce the promise of God because you learned to stand on God's word even when no one else will stand. Amen? Amen. It's like that old hymn, I have decided to follow Jesus, and though none go with me. You know, Lord, if every other saint in this building walked out and decided I'm not going to serve you anymore, Lord, I'm going to serve you. And God taught Moses to stand at the Red Sea. Lord, couldn't you have had those waters ready? We're such a microwave society, you know. Here we are, Lord. We're at the waters. The Egyptians are breathing down our neck. They're marching toward us. They're encamped against us. Why don't you have these waters ready? You know what he said? Stand still and see the salvation of God. You know, the Israelites were going to get to the place where they were going to romance their time with the Egyptians, romance the food that they ate there, romance the culture that they lived in, but God wanted them to remember the angry faces marching towards them as they were stuck in between the Egyptians and the Red Sea. You know, some would say, if trouble's chasing you down, you must be out of the will of God. But I'll say, no. If, troub if you are troubled, you know, God, or Satan doesn't press on compromisers. You know, if you're compromising and you're doing everything the devil wants, you're not a threat to him. Amen. So Moses is up against the armies of Egypt and the great Red Sea, Exodus 14 and 13. And the Moses said to the people, fear ye not, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will shew you today for the Egyptians whom ye have seen. You shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you. And ye shall hold your peace. One thing about standing up against the devil and standing up against the world is that when you learn to stand, God will fight for you. And like Moses, we need to learn to stand still and wait on God because God is always going to show up to fight for us. You know, we might find ourselves in tight spaces with spears and swords and guns pointed at us, death threats, spiritual death threats. You know, the, the serpent may even strike us, but just like Paul, we're going to shake that wily snake back in the fire, amen? Mark 16 and 17, And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. They shall cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. 
they shall lay their hands on the sick and they shall recover. Because when you're a true believer, I'm telling you, when you're a true believer, you learn to stand, amen? So after the Hebrews crossed over, Moses was up on the mountain and the people made a molten calf out of their jewelry and they compromised. Exodus 32 and 2, and Aaron said to them, break off the golden earrings which are in your ears of your wives and of your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. And all the people, they broke off their earrings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. And you'll notice a theme in the Bible with jewelry. And jewelry is always connected to pride and idolatry. Exodus 33 and 5, For the Lord had said to Moses, Say to the children of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. I could come up into your midst in one moment and consume you. Now, therefore, take off your ornaments that I may know what to do with you. And so they're decked out in their jewelry. They're decked out in their fine garments. And the Lord wants to get down to the knit grit. And he says, take off your jewelry. Take off your ornaments. Take off your fine linen. I want to know what I'm going to do with you today. But Moses was a man that knew how to stand. And Moses was a man that would stand against the wrath of God when the Lord was going to destroy the people. Moses, the man that seen God's glory. Moses, the man that God chose. Moses, the man that was leading the people. Now he stands against God's wrath. Why do you think God chose Moses? If you kill him, Lord, you might as well kill me. I love you, Lord, but I'm one of them. And I'm not looking for power. I'm not looking for position. I'm just looking to stand. A new nation, a new people, a new father, Father Moses. No, Lord, destroy me as well. And that's what the Lord was looking for in a man. A man that no matter how angry the people made him, he would still stand up for them. And the most powerful thing that we could do in most situations is just stand. Stand when no one else will stand. Sometimes the Lord will allow a messenger of Satan to slap you around like a slap fall. What do we have in here to slap people around with? Nobody likes to be slapped around, right? Tommy's smiling because... You know, I asked him this evening, I said, you feel like doing cartwheels, Tommy? I'm a little tired tonight. Well, maybe I could catch you and show the church how the devil likes to buffet people. But, you know, I don't want to pick on Tommy tonight. Who do I want to pick on? Who wants to be a messenger of Satan? <laughs> Who said me? Jacob, come here. Come here, Jacob. Uh, we can't pick Tommy because he's too fast. All right, we need. All right. <laughs> okay, you're the messenger of Satan. Don't hit him in the face, but you can hit him everywhere else. <laughs> Which one of you is Paul? Uh, you, son, come stand over here. So you're just trying to do what's right. You're just trying to, you know, raise your family in this wonderful truth. And here comes a little blue-eyed devil. Go ahead and hit him, devil. This is Paul. You don't like him. Hit him not too hard, but go on. Get him. All right? Like this, like this. All right? All right, I'm going to take the limitations off because you're fast. Don't let him hit you. Go ahead, hit him. He's a pinata. <laughs> you ain't getting no candy like that, son. <laughs> Get him. Get him. Well, I hope the Lord sends me a little devil like that. <laughs> because, you know, I wouldn't mind that. But you're trying, <laughs> you're trying to do what's right. 
you know, and the devil just likes to throw things in your way. He likes to distract you. You know, he likes to take your focus off of God, and he's, he's a master at that. Maybe God will send an angel to wrestle you, like Jacob. I wonder if we got any wrestlers in this place. Leo Barba's a big wrestler. <laughs> I'll pitch you up against another big guy. <laughs> but you know what? Maybe God's going to send you a, an angel to wrestle with. Jacob, after 20 years of service to Laban, being cheated so many times and bearing each loss of Laban's flock, caught wind that Laban's sons were upset, Jacob's wealth grew and Laban's wealth diminished. And now the family fortune that was supposed to be left to them is all in possession of Jacob. So you can understand why their sons are, you know, Laban was very well off and now Jacob's got everything. And so Laban's countenance was changed. You ever notice somebody really upset with you? You know, there have been some times, you know, I know I'm one of them when I'm mad, I just can't hide it. <laughs> I turn red, too, but some people turn really red. But you know what? They just, they're just mad at you. They don't want to even smell you. I don't like the way that person smells anymore. You could be just doing something simple like eating a hamburger. I don't like the way she eats that hamburger. Look at her. She thinks she's so good. <laughs> but Laban was upset. You know, he's getting poor and Jacob's getting rich. And, you know, that's not the way he planned it. But when you cheat the people of God, God's going to find a way to take all your resources and give it to them. So Jacob decides to steal away. He decides to escape because of the angel of God's advice. Now, uh, Jacob was trapped between his, his father-in-law's livelihood and the little ones he stole away with and his big, bad-bearded brother, whose birthright he stole. Now, uh, the only difference now is this mighty hunter has 400 men with him. You know, Jacob's trapped. Where am I going to go? I'm, I'm threatened on this side, and I'm threatened on this side, and I just don't know what to do. And then the Lord says, well, why don't we throw this into the mix? I'll send a man to kill you in the middle of the night. <laughs> and sometimes that's the way it is in our walk with God. God likes to pressure us because he wants to see the greatness that he could bring out of you. Now, uh, Laban wants to whip Jacob for running away. You know, being met by an angel, Laban's warned not to speak evil nor good to Jacob. So they set up a pillar as a witness. Laban warns Jacob, if you afflict my daughters, if you take any other wives besides my daughters, if you cross this line of rock heaps, there may be some harm. And after this, Jacob sends gifts to Esau, and he crosses over the four Jabbok, which means the passage that's pouring forth. And because when you're on the right path, it's going to be a rough path sometimes. You know, you're going to have to stand against angels sometimes. Sometimes you'll try to find a place to meditate. And try to find a place to clear your mind. And then, boom, Jacob is attacked in the middle of the night. You know, at first, Jacob is wrestling a man until the breaking of day. But when the man realized that it couldn't prevail over Jacob... It was revealed that the man was an angel. Now, Jacob, upon all your other problems, you've got to out-wrestle an angel. And the angel touches the hollow of his, his thigh and his hip is now out of joint. You know, can you stand, Jacob? You know, you're disabled now. Your hip's out of joint. Can you keep your grip, Jacob, on this angel? You know, you've been wrestling all night, you know, and when you realize towards the end, you're wrestling with God himself. A new name I give you, Jacob, wrestles with God, 
contends with God, triumphant with God. And in the darkest times of your fight with men and angels and God come the greatest blessing. And Jacob would now be called Israel, a prince. And even though, Jacob, you have to limp around for the rest of your life. You know, Jacob was the first one with the gangster walk. Your experience with God has taught you to stand. You can't even walk right anymore. You know, you got a thorn in your flesh now. But God has taught you to stand against the wiles of the devil. God would help Jacob mend things between him and Esau, but later call him to build an altar to get rid of all the jewelry and the idols. Genesis 35 and 1. Then God said to Jacob, arise and go to Bethel and dwell there and make an altar there to God who appeared to you when you fled from the face of Esau, your brother. And Jacob said to his household and to all that were with him, put away the foreign gods. You know, Jacob, it's time to draw a line. We should have took care of this a long time ago. We should have made a stand a long time ago, but now we're going to draw a line and put away all the foreign gods that are among you. Purify yourselves and change your garments. Then let us arise and go up to Bethel. I will make an altar there to God who answered me in the day of my distress and has been with me in the way which I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods which were in their hands and the earrings which were in their ears, and Jacob hid them under the terebinth tree which was by Shechem. And I wonder tonight how many little jewels and idols we need to give up in our lives. You know, what kind of things are we housing? You know, we see things so many times, they just become, you know, second hand to us. But I remember raising my kids, and this is my nephew Joey, and he hated me. All right? Joey Hill, he hated me because, you know what, he would try to come into my house and bring those Yu-Gi-Oh cards. And I told him, no, that ain't coming into my house. No magic cards, no nothing like that because my house is a house of prayer. But now that Joey's grown up and he's serving God, guess what? Do you still hate me? You know, when he was backslid, he was like, you better not be preaching about me. I'm going to be so mad. <laughs> but now guess what, Joey? You're saved. You're doing good. And you know what? I'm preaching to you, brother. I'm preaching to you. Let's give the Lord a good hand clap tonight for what he's doing in Joey's life. You know what? He's getting his stuff together. You know, he's got a little daughter now, and he's working on that. But you know what? If we don't see a two, three services in a row, we're all going to get together, pitchforks and torches. <laughs> Just kidding. But God is good, you know, and, and there were some things that I drew a line on. I didn't want in my house. I didn't want my kids to have. I don't, can't remember if it was Tristan or one of the other boys. You know, the Holy Ghost would come upon me, and I'd be like, check their backpack. You know, it would be random, random checks, you know. And I would be like, they'd come through the door. I'm all, I've am all. i been praying, red-faced, snot coming out of my nose, tears coming out. Give me that backpack, boy. Let's see what you got in here. And so, you know, it was the element of surprise. You know, eventually they snuck some things by us, but for the most part we did a good job. And one time I pull out this book, Wizards and Dragons and Magic, Get this book out. It's a library book. I don't care if it's a library book. This, ha this book doesn't belong in my house. And you know what? He was upset with me. He was all the way to the end and didn't get to finish the end of the book. But I didn't care because I told him. But you got to make a stand. Amen. You know what I'm appalled by? And I'm just going to go say it because, you know, you've already made your decision on what you think about me. But these little dolls that these girls are playing with nowadays, these little 
Dolls that look like harlots. They look like harlots. They got makeup. They got short skirts. They got all these things, you know. I'm telling you, you can't teach your daughter. You can't raise her up the way she should go if she's putting pants on her dolls. Mom, how come I could put pants on my dolls, but I can't wear pants to school? I'm telling you, you know what? We made a line when, when the Bible said, a woman shall not wear that which pertains to a man. God drew a line, and we still stand by that line. I don't care how long it's been. We still believe in the things that God preached. But mom... I see you run around in pants. I don't know why I'm here. Pastor's going to probably be mad at me, but I got to obey the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Mom, I see you running around in pants. Oh, I'm just running to the store. Do you run to the store in a dress, son? No, sir. Are, are you telling me just because uh, uh, they're females they could get away with this? No. You know, if you was cross-dressing... Oh, we'd be in an uproar, man. If you tried to wear a pair of high heels, oh, man, we, we'd give you the five-fold ministry till you believed. <laughs> oh, but it's girl. It's a girl. It's okay. We need to get that feminist spirit out of the church. I don't care if the world tells you. I don't care if your friends tell you. If the Bible tells you, you need to make a stand, and you need to stand on the Word of God. So I see you running around in pants, Mom. Can you explain that? Why do you still got pants in your closet? I'm sorry. <laughs> Why do you still got, are you waiting for the day that you backslide? Come on. You know what? <laughs> Some people need to get up and get in their closets tonight. You need to get in your closets and every little thing you've been saving for the time that you're just going to have such a good time with the devil, you need to get rid of that junk. He's not looking to have a good time with you. He's looking to get you on a hook. Hopefully that's enough on that. But you know what? There's a biblical description on how God sees these proud, adorned women. Isaiah 3.16, God says, Zion women are stuck up, prancing around with their heads held high. They're making eyes at all the men in the streets. They know how to do it. They're swinging their hips. I'm not going to do it because I don't want pastor to have some questions about me. You know, they're tossing their hair. They know just how, right when you look at them, <laughs> oh, their hair, you know. They know exactly how to put it on. Gaudy and garnish and noisy jewelry. And the prophet would go on to tell how God would remove the jewelry and the luxury of the adornment from the women of Zion. God wasn't happy with their prideful ways. But Peter had it right when he wrote about the high-value women in 1 Peter 3 and 1. In like manner, wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. I want to hear that tire go flat. I didn't hear the tire go flat, Pastor. We may have some godly women up in this place. In like manner, wives, be in subjection to your own husbands. That even if they... If any obey not in word, they may without the word be won over by the behavior of their wives, having witnessed your pure conduct and your respect, whose adorning let it not be the outward adorning of the plating of hair and the wearing of jewels of gold or putting on the apparel, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in the incorruptible apparel of the meek and quiet spirit which is in the sight of God a great price. 
So you know what, women, you're going to win your husbands if your husband ain't in church. You're going to win them with good behavior and respect, the Bible says. Not by nagging them, not by beating them, not by telling them he's never going to make it in God, not by telling them his ministry is destroyed, not by telling them he's a no good, pathetic man, but by telling them, I know you can make it. I know you can make it. God's not done with us yet, amen? So I'll throw this in for whatever it's worth being acceptable to God. It's also short hair on men and long hair on women, which is her covering and her glory. So 1 Corinthians chapter 11 explains that a woman going before God with her head uncovered, i.e. her hair cut, dishonors her head. And that's you, man. She dishonors her head, and if your wife or your daughters are cutting their hair, they dishonor you before God. I could hear that tire go flat. You know, maybe we need to throw away some scissors out of some drawers. You know, go home, take the pants, throw them out, take them haircut and scissors, throw them out. We got any believers in, oh, you know, we still want to hold the line, men. You don't, you don't wear no beards, but we, we want to snip, 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 snip. That's what the Bible says. I could go flat, but that's what the Bible says. So uh, I know we have some good Christian women in this congregation. But the richest man in the east was not so lucky. Job found his wife standing over him in the middle of his trial, telling him to curse God and die. And imagine Satan being able, allowed to take everything dear to you, But there in the middle of everything is a frowning face unscathed. This is what you left me, Lord? Maybe the devil thought, I need someone on the inside. To revile Job, I'll leave a scowling wife. And I wish we knew her name because we wouldn't name anyone after her in our family, I'll tell you that. But God forbid you're a spouse that when you see your husband or your wife struggling, you just kick them like a dog. I've been waiting for you to get sick. I've been waiting for the pressures of life to be on you. Now that you're down, I don't know why I'm picking on you tonight. Now that you're down, you know, that's not the way that a husband and a wife are supposed to treat each other. You know, the husband's supposed to protect, supposed to guard, and the woman's supposed to help lift up the man, you know. Don't be pit against each other by Satan, but help each other out, amen? So uh, you may feel like uh, they deserve it when you're kicking them, but uh, nobody needs their partner belittling them, amen? Let's go ahead and stand. So Job was blown away, and imagine engaging, you know. Job just lost everything, everything but his beautiful wife. Dear, do you think you could get me a glass of water? And your wife turning back to you and saying, Job, you just need to curse God and die. Look at you, you pathetic man. And I hope you don't think your man is pathetic tonight. Because if your husband is struggling, the Lord created the woman to help the man. And that's Bible. You know, when we're drowning in life, when we feel like we're being pushed underneath the water and we reach out our hand, it's not time to withhold your help. Amen. Her statement tells a story, you know, when all the riches are gone, when all the servants are gone, when all the children are gone, what good are you, Job? You know, she could have said, Job, you're enough. Job, you're enough. You know, we may have lost the family fortune. We may have lost our children. You may have lost your health. 
But it's these times when we need help the most. Amen. doesn't matter how spiritual you are if you can't line up the spiritual authority. doesn't matter how spiritual you are if you can't stand. If you're going to fall to every temptation that comes your way. Some people need to make up their mind. From this point forward, never going to cross this line. This line is for me, Brother Jose. This line is for my wife. This line is for my family. We ain't ever crossing this line again. You know, man, I've, I've bragged on the women a lot. Love you, women. Don't beat me up. Don't be waiting outside for me. But, but man, you need to be a man that can stand against a blasphemer like Paul. You need to be a man that can stand against the world like Moses. You need to be a man that can stand against your own family and wrestle with angels and God. And you need to be a man that can stand against Satan himself and whoever Satan pits against you like Job. And when you become a man that could stand against all these things, then you may be the type of man that will stand against the wrath of God and say, if there were so many people in Sodom who are righteous, will you still destroy it, Lord? Would you still destroy a righteous nation? Did you bring your people out into the desert just to kill them? These altars are open tonight. Exodus 32 and 13, remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and saidest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have spoken will I give to your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do to his people. Amen.